Welcome to the Trainers Bullpen, where trainers in the law enforcement space come to hear the experts talk about their work, experience, and research into human performance, particularly as it relates to the critical aspects of training motor learning, adaptive decision making, and professional policing skills. The purpose of the Trainers Bullpen is to help bridge the gap between law enforcement training and the findings of academic research and current pedagogical best practice. Our desire here at the Trainers Bullpen is to help advance law enforcement training to make research applied and improve officer and public safety. The Trainers Bullpen is a production of Raptor Protection, and I'm Chris Butler, your host. And today it's my pleasure to welcome to the show Brian Willis. Brian operates Winning Mind Training Inc., a company dedicated to serving the heroic men and women of law enforcement through the core values of focus on what's important now, stay curious and seek to inspire others. Brian was a full-time police officer with the Calgary Police Service for 25 years and has over 33 years of law enforcement training experience. He is the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award in recognition of his contribution and commitment to officer safety in Canada, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal in recognition of his contributions to the policing profession, and the Law, Law Officer Trainer of the Year Award. In addition to his work with public safety professionals, Brian has served as a mental preparation coach for athletes from a variety of sports, including Canadian Olympic athletes. Brian has conducted group and individual imagery sessions across North America to law enforcement officers, trainers, athletes, coaches, and individuals seeking positive change in their lives. Brian has also trained hundreds of law enforcement trainers and coaches from around North America to utilize performance enhancement imagery as a method of affecting powerful change in officers and athlete performance. Brian is proud to serve as the Deputy Executive Director for the International Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association. Brian, thanks for making time to join us on the Trainers Bullpen today. My pleasure, Chris. It's an honor to be here. So, Brian, we are, this is going to be the third in, I think, which will be a very exciting and informative three-part series on the use of imagery, or as you call it, performance enhancement imagery. And for our listeners, we'd encourage you, if you haven't listened to the first two, to go back and listen to the first one with Dr. Adam Nichols from Hall University. Dr. Nichols is the author of Psychology and Sports Coaching, and he has a chapter in his textbook on the use of mental imagery. The second in this series is by Dr. Arner Neuenhaus. Dr. Neuenhaus from New Zealand has done research specifically with the use of mental imagery in police officer shooting performance. And this is the third. And so we're going to be talking to Brian Willis because Brian has, I believe, the most extensive experience of anywhere of actually using performance enhancement imagery in the law enforcement context. So, Brian, let's uh, before we even begin to get into the questions, maybe we'll just have set some definitions so everybody knows what we're talking about. So when we talk about imagery or as you use the term performance enhancement imagery, and maybe you can tell us how you came up with that. Um, but maybe can you define that? What what do you mean by imagery and how is it different from the term visualization that we often hear? Excellent. So the, the definition that I use for imagery is using one's senses to create or recreate an experience in the mind. So using one's senses to create or recreate an experience in the mind. And the purpose of performance enhancement imagery then is basically to focus and direct the imagination to enhance performance uh, in any re arena of performance. And that's pretty broad. As far as why uh, imagery versus visualization, and I'm not a fan of the term visualization, and, and you certainly had that conversation with Adam and Arne uh, as well. Uh, and for me, it started with uh, when I started using imagery and talking about it a long time ago, um, I 
knew that it was important, that the mental preparation piece was important. But when I talked about the imagery piece, I always felt like a uh, fraud because uh, when I, I could imagine any type of an attack scenario or any situation, but I never saw any pictures. And so uh, when you read a lot of the, the, the material, it was very uh, visual focused. So the term visualization tends to speak to a singular sense, the visual sense. And you hear people say, uh, picture in your mind's eye, get a very clear picture in your mind, see yourself doing this. Uh, I can see what you're saying. We, we use very visual language. The problem is that's not how everybody processes information. And so once I figured this out, as I continued to delve into my research, then what I started to do is I started to talk about it in uh, the classes and in the, the training program, the excellence in training courses and other programs to help people understand that while everybody processes information in images, those aren't always pictures. It might be a feeling, it might be an experience, it might be an awareness. And as I talked about this, um, I've had countless people come up to me over the years at workshops and in courses and say, I'm glad you talked about that because I was going to ask you if you could fix me because when I do visualization, I don't see anything. Uh, and I've had people say, you know what, I've read all of the books. A lot of the sports psychology books are written in very visual language. Uh, and I thought I was broken. Or I've had people that said, you know what, I used to hate it when the coach did that visualization stuff because I didn't see any pictures. I had one college uh, coach tell me after he'd gone through an imagery workshop, he said, you know what? He said, I've been telling athletes for 40 years using to visualize using very visual language. And he said, I've had all kinds of athletes come up to me over the years and say, coach, when you don't, when you do that, I don't see anything. And he said, my, my response was always, well, just try harder. It'll come. Well, they can probably try as hard as they want and it's not going to happen. Um, the other piece of it is that if you go back, we go back to the definition using one's senses, we're talking about all the senses, not just a visual sense. So it's how I might feel uh, emotionally, uh, kinesthetic senses, any smells or sounds that might be in the environment. So I think visualization is very uh, too narrow a term. And for some people, um, when they hear that visual language, they just tune out or they get frustrated because they think they can't do it. So that's why I prefer the term imag <laughs> imagery or imagine versus visualize. Uh, and I continue to reinforce that and hammer that message home when I talk about these concepts. Okay, that's fantastic. So let's go back in time now, Brian. Let's uh, start with uh, how did you first get into performance enhancement imagery and and incorporate it into your training at that time? Well, as you're well aware, with the Calgary Police Service, we had line of duty deaths in back-to-back -back years. So in 1992 and 1993, we had officers killed in the line of duty. Following uh, Rick Sonnenberg's death uh, in 1993, the Calgary Police Service uh, acknowledged that we were doing, and I'm going to say a reasonable job at the time, uh, with some of the officer safety issues for re recruits. But we, like many agencies, were dropping the ball for in-service personnel and providing ongoing training. So they put together a committee, as we often do. Now, this committee was... Uh, basically operational level people from around the organization, uh, from our tactical unit, from the training section, from other areas, to look at putting together uh, an officer safety course. Ultimately, we put together a 40-hour officer safety course. Uh, then a few years later, we put together a level two course, which uh, you were a part of that development. One of the elements of the original course was mental preparation, mental conditioning, because we recognized that it was important. But it wasn't the sexy running, gunning, shooting, fighting stuff. It was kind of that out there unknown part. Everybody thought it was important, but nobody really knew a lot about it. So most of the people didn't want to teach it. I thought it was important, so I took it on. And then that started for me what became a lifelong kind of obsession to figure out how do we best prepare the mind and the body for where they might have to go. Because I think we do a, a reasonable job of preparing the body. I think we're still paying lip service to preparing the mind. So I started to delve into this. At the time, part of the course was some information out of Street Survival by uh, Chuck Remsburg and Denny Anderson, and then uh, some of their ongoing books. But I started to 
look into and started to do a bunch of reading in the area of sports psychology. So uh, not textbooks, but uh, books that sports psychologists or coaches or athletes or other people had written uh, around how they use some of these techniques. I started to explore things like hypnosis, neurolinguistic programming, uh, meditation. What were these other modalities and are they all the same thing or the, what are the similarities? What are the differences? How can we pull from each of those? Um, and then started to cobble together. And I started implementing some of this, some imagery, some basic imagery in that officer safety course back in probably 1995. Um, and then it has evolved as my understanding and my education in this area has continued to develop. But that's how I got started with it. And uh, again, I would go to the bookstore, which I guess in today's world is a bit of a foreign concept. But I, I, I think people need to consider the time frame, right? So do a, do a now Google search on uh, the World Wide Web and when it was launched and Google and when it was created and launched. Um, and that was really the era before the World Wide Web and Google search was out there for a lot of these things. So it was a matter of talking to other trainers at conferences, going to bookstores and uh, weeding through and finding some of these and doing a lot of reading and then continuing to. Uh, I just started jumping into it and started doing it and then uh, have evolved it over time. Now, Brian, you mentioned that as nobody else wanted to take this on because it was it was one of those concepts that was out there it wasn't tangible like you said the sexy running and gunning and all that and the fighting and everything else but in your experience has that really changed or is that one of the stumbling blocks because it's one of the things that i hear is trainers if they are you'll find the rare trainer who's really interested in this area of of psychological performance and mental preparation but they often will say that they experience just a resistance, uh, whether that's culturally or it's just kind of weird uh, from other trainers. And uh, so when you do your your courses, is that do you talk about that? Do you provide some strategies for trainers on how they could look to successfully incorporate this in, in their agency? Uh, absolutely. And I think it's something that most trainers understand at some level the importance of mental preparation, mental rehearsal, crisis rehearsal, mental movies, uh, visualization, all those terms that get used in this arena. I think what scares us, like in so many areas of life, is it's the unknown. We're scared of what we don't know. And we're a lot of times scared to say, you know what, I don't know. Uh, but let me figure it out or let me find out and talk to somebody. The other thing is I think sometimes we think it's it, it's exclusively the realm of sports psychologists, um, and it's not. It's something that uh, – imagery is something that everybody does. Everybody does. We just need to figure out how to be more intentional and deliberate about it. So how do we address it? Well, what I do is I help people understand that imagery is something that they do every day. It's part of their everyday life. So as a trainer, when you're planning an upcoming course, uh, you're using your imagination. You're imagining the course. You're imagining the facilities. You're imagining what drills and exercises you're going to run. You're going to imagine how much time this is going to take. You're going to imagine the logistical help that you need. Um, if you're planning a vacation, whether you're going on a cruise or you're taking your kids to Disneyland or Disney World, you're imagining all those elements. You're imagining the logistics. You're imagining the fun. You're imagining the sites, the scenery, uh, the all-you-can-eat buffets, the all-you-can-drink bars, whatever it is you're imagining. Um, so, but sometimes we, if you think about worry and anxiety, anxiety at a basic, very basic level is our subconscious mind imagining the worst possible outcome for an event. Uh, so we're using imagery all the time. So I start by helping people understand that something that they already do. And when you start talking about, you know, have you, how many of you, when you're talking to law enforcement professionals, police professionals, say, how many of you have ever been out driving around and you've been driving by the 7-Eleven or whatever your local stop and rob is, and you imagine if there was, you're driving by and there's a robbery in progress, what would you do? Well, everybody puts their hand up. Well, that's imagery. If we do if then, when then thinking, if this was to happen, then what could I do? Um, that's 
imagery. We're imagining all the possibilities. Then the when is we're accepting that it's going to happen. The time, place, location, specifics are unknown. But when it does, now I have a plan because I've thought through it. I've imagined how to solve this problem. So once people start to realize that, hey, I've done this already. In fact, I had an officer two weeks ago that shared his story in his in defeating cancer at a significant level to the point where when he was being taken home from the hospital, they had a procession like you see in funeral processions for law enforcement where the streets were lined. There's this long line of cars and he's in one of those cars being transported home from the hospital. And he said in that entire procession with all those people there, I was the only one who did not believe that I was going to die. Um, and so he used imagery uh, through his battle with this and he's now thriving in life. Um, and he, what he said to me is he said, you know, I never really thought about it as imagery, but I used imagery all the time. It was an imagery course that he was he was on. So we start with that. Then we talk about athletics. If anybody's ever watched an interview with an Olympian after winning a medal, they will talk about imagery. I've imagined this my whole life. Uh, you know, I've dreamt about this and they will use this type of language. Athletes do imagery all the time. The best performers in the world. Anybody that's watched uh, Winter Olympics has seen skiers up at the top of the hill, off to the side, their eyes closed, their bodies moving. And what they're doing is they're doing run after run after run in their mind down that hill. They're using imagery to enhance their performance in that event. So when we start to talk about the fact that everybody, we all do imagery anyways, we just need to figure out how to be more intentional and deliberate about it. And that the top performers in the world, and I share a quote from a former Navy SEAL that I had the opportunity to interview. And he talked about the fact that he said, we did a mental dirt dive into every operation that we did. So if this is part of, the top performers in the world in any uh, arena of performance, then we need to start paying attention to that. And then I sh will share some stories. Uh, so in the imagery course, I share a whole bunch of examples of people that have used imagery from law enforcement to athletics to everybody's familiar with Sully Sullenberger, the uh, retired U.S. Airways captain who, along with Jeff Skiles, his first officer, landed U U.S. Airways Flight 1549 on the Hudson River on July 15, 2009 in a controlled water landing. Now, Sully Sullenberger, if you listen to interviews with him or read his books, he talks about the fact that they'd flown in and out of those airports in New York a um, large number of times. And he had always imagined what he would do either coming in or flying out if there was an emergency and he had to put the plane down and couldn't get to one of the airports. And where is there that's long enough, wide enough, flat enough in the New York area that I could put a plane down, an A320 down without guaranteeing to kill everybody on board and kill a bunch of people on the ground. He also talks about when he was in the U.S. Air Force Academy. So he learned how to fly as a teenager, then became a fighter pilot in the U.S. Air Force. But he talked about in the U.S. Air Force Academy, he said, when I'm learning to fly 50 or $60 million fighter planes, he said, we get limited flying time. He said, it's not like you're flying all day, every day. So he said, I did, and what my uh, other uh, mates did in the academy is we did plunger training. He said, I'd sit in my dorm room with a $5 plunger, and I would close my eyes, and I would hold that plunger and imagine it was a control stick on that fighter plane, and I would imagine flying a 50 or $60 million fighter jet uh, in uh, using a $5 plunger. Uh, Michelle Mace Curran, who is, uh, was a uh, fighter pilot in the U.S. Air Force, combat veteran, the first female member of the uh, U.S. Air Force Falcons precision flying team, talked about doing chair uh, flying, where she would sit in her dorm room in a chair and imagine flying. And so when you start to share these examples, then all of a sudden people realize that, hey, this isn't some woo-woo out there thing. This is part of everyday life. Now our goal is to figure out how do we be more intentional and deliberate about it? How do we expand the use of it so that we can help people to enhance their performance? So that's some of the ways that I address it. And then people start to realize, you know what, it's, 
okay, I'm doing it. Um, and other people I know are doing it. So let's figure out how to do it perhaps more effectively. Right. Excellent. And you shared some great examples from outside of law enforcement and your experience of using this. Brian, do you have some examples of performance successes, whether that's because I think Im the other thing with imagery is it's not just physical skill performance improvement, right? I mean, it certainly can improve those skills, but there's a whole variety of other areas that imagery can improve performance. So do you have some specific examples from law enforcement that you can share? Well, we used to, as you know, I mean, we used to do a lot of structured imagery with recruits. Um, and so we would have a lot of them that would come to us late in training. Uh, the firearms unit would refer them to us uh, because they were struggling to qualify. They could shoot. They just had a mental block around qualification. So it was not a skill issue. And so we would do imagery with them just to change that mental image that they have of themselves from somebody from the image of I can't qualify or always struggle to qualify to I am skilled and confident with my firearm and I can qualify anytime, anywhere. And we had a lot of success with that. A uh, trainer down in the U.S. who went through the, the training, the imagery training, uh, sent me an email one day and said, you know what, I had two in-service shooters. Their qualification course was out of 250. He said one came in and shot a 145, one shot a 165, and I believe 210 was the qualification mark. He did some imagery with each of them, did a few drills. The 145 shooter went out and shot a 225, and the 165 shooter went out and shot a 245. Um, and then those those levels continue because they can shoot, they just can't qualify. So we started doing it with um, around mindset and, as you know, to, to prepare for physical skills, to enhance uh, motor skills and motor learning. And I know you talk about the difference between those two uh, so that they could imagine not only rehearsing perhaps the skills, but also applying them in a real world environment, real world setting and overcoming issues and problems. Uh, but we also, I've done imagery with people that, uh, in law enforcement that um, had to do a an oral interview board to get promoted or get into a special unit. Highly qualified, but they said every time I go to sit down in that oral interview board, my mind goes into vapor lock. And so we can help. All that is is a mental block. It's just performance anxiety. Um, so we would do imagery with that. Or people that would... Uh, we're physically capable of passing the fitness test to get into tactical team or canine, but again, would have a mental block when they went to do the actual test, test anxiety performance. And so we would do imagery with them to change some of that. There was an officer with Calgary Police Service that, that um, about a year and a half after graduating, was uh, diagnosed with a brain tumor. Um, very, very serious, very rare form of brain tumor at the base of his brain, his cerebellum, part of it wrapped around his C1, C2 vertebrae, part of it wrapped around his carotid artery. Uh, the surgeon told him that uh, he had a 50-50 chance of living through the surgery. And if he happened to live through the surgery, then he was done as a cop, would never work again as a police officer in his life, and in fact, may never work again in his life. And Scott decided that he could either buy into the doom and gloom and probably die in the operating table, or he could use some of these mental skills that we had taught him as a recruit, um, and he could use those to defeat this threat like every other threat. Um, and so not only did he overcome that and recover from brain surgery, but 13 or 14 months after the brain surgery, he was back working the street with the Calgary Police Service. Now, one of the things that he did in his, his uh, <clears throat> rehab is he knew that when he went back to work, because he was convinced he was going back to work, is that he was going to have to qualify with his firearms. And so he <laughs> he did mental rehearsal about uh, an imagery around firearms qualification. When he went back, uh, he goes down to the range for a day. Uh, they let him shoot a little bit. He goes back the next day. Uh, they said, you can come and see if you can qualify. Well, he shows up the next day. Now, he physically, prior to the day before, he had not physically handled the gun for about 14 months. And he aced all his firearms qualification shoots. He was a better shooter 
after the brain surgery than he was before. And so he used that skill to enhance his recovery from brain surgery and enhance a skill of uh, shooting while uh, not actually conducting that physical skill. So there's all kinds of examples. I mean, I could go on for the whole hour just talking about some of the success stories, but there's all kinds of examples uh, from all different elements and all different domains uh, that uh, where people have successfully used imagery as a tool to enhance, to change mindset, to change that self-belief or self-perception, or to enhance physical skills. So is it one of the, you talked about anxiety, and I think, is, is that perhaps one of the most common types of issues for that is a block to performance? Because very rarely is it actually you know, somebody just can't physically perform a skill. And I know there's been research and Dr. Nichols talked about how imagery can be used for accelerating skill acquisition and that. But in your experience, when we're talking about police officers who have to perform an extremely high stress, high consequence types of events where anxiety, phys physiological arousal, you know, the old Yerkes Dodson relationship that we talk about is if we can't control that emotional regulation and physiological arousal, then things start to fall apart pretty quickly after that. And so in your experience, is that perhaps one of the, the primary areas where officers really can benefit from the use of performance enhancement imagery? Yeah, and I think there's a couple of elements to that. So one is the test anxiety. So one of the biggest anxiety factors for law enforcement is failing in front of their peers. That's why they there's so much anxiety around firearms qualification, test anxiety with written tests, uh, some of these other elements. I mean, I know uh, there's firearms instructors that were at Quantico that were firearms instructors for the FBI that have gone through uh, the training. Um, and you're familiar with, I know, because I know you've shot it before, that bullseye shoot out of 300, which is a very much a marksmanship shoot. And for example, one of the instructors said, you know what, he said, any given day, I can go out there by myself and I can shoot a 298, 299, occasionally a 300. But you put me on the line with 20 other firearms instructors from Quantico, and I'm lucky if I can shoot a 230. I know firearms instructors that won't do demos in front of recruits because of the anxiety that they have around that. What happens if I miss a shot? What happens if I pull a shot? What happens if I don't do whatever? So I think anxiety. Then I think there's the other element of arousal control out in the field in these tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving events um, that that certainly is a factor and another factor that uh, can be addressed through imagery. Now, I think the other one of the causes of uh, some of these arousal, high arousal states out in the street is the lack of effective training at the front end. So they get thrust into these situations and they don't know how to fix a problem or they're so locked in trying to apply a technique that they uh, taught were taught in a very controlled situation in training and they it's not working and they don't know how to work their way out of that. So I think that if we're looking to, I believe that the goal of training and trainers is to develop, help our people to become dexterous, adaptive problem solvers. And I think imagery is a tool that can help them with that and can help them with that arousal control piece. Uh, so absolutely from a whole range of uh, environments that they're going to have to perform in. Okay. And so, I mean, the goal would be ultimately when an officer leaves, let's say the academy, let's take a recruit example, we've got them for five or six months in the academy. If we're going to be using performance enhancement imagery, certainly we wouldn't want that skill to come to a conclusion at the when they graduate and leave the academy, right? We want them when they're out on the street, out in the car, in the field, to be independent, good mental, they can, they're able to use those skills independently. So what would your approach be, Brian, to, because I know maybe we start this by what's the difference between guided imagery and independent imagery and how would you move from facilitating a guided imagery sessions to having a, a student become more independent and able to perform these skills on their own? So the independent imagery is that imagery that we do uh, on our own all the time. Um, and like I said, part of that is helping people understand that they're doing it all the time and then how to help 
to help them understand how to be more intentional and deliberate about it uh, from a specific uh, performance enhancement standpoint. Whereas guided imagery would be something where the trainer or the coach or the instructor would be either reading a script, taking people through a scripted imagery session there, or they would be listening to an audio recording of it. So I can audio record things and people can listen to that uh, on their own time as often as they like. So it would be someone else then guiding the performer through what it is that they're going to imagine uh, and the different elements of that. So I think it's important from uh, a recruit training standpoint that we need to start this discussion early, like ideally week one or week two. So at one point, we, uh, with Calgary, as you know, we used to get two days of mental preparation conditioning uh, with recruits, days one and two of week two. So we could lay the foundation for a bunch of this and then build on it throughout. So ideally, we would lay these foundations right at the start of the academy. Ideally, which uh, very few, if anybody ever works or lives in an ideal world, um, this would be part of something that every trainer would do. In every session throughout the entire academy, that we'd be weaving elements of imagery into that. Uh, and I can talk about how we might do that. But I think we need to develop both these skills at the same time. Uh, on a parallel path. So have them understand, have the recruits understand that this is something they've done their whole life, right? Kids use their imagination all the time. And so we've been doing it, we've been doing it our whole life. So give them permission to experience it however they experience it, whether there's pictures or not is critical and then help them to understand how to do it and then start to then do some guided stuff with them. And then at different times uh, have them uh, do it where they're just doing it themselves. Where, so for example, uh, sometimes what I would do in control tactics as part of a warm up is I would say, okay, just find a spot in the mat by yourself. You can do this eyes open or eyes closed, but uh, I want you to imagine that you're talking to an individual and they're going to step in and they're going to throw uh, <clears throat> some kind of a punch at you. And you're going to imagine deflecting or blocking or parrying that attack, uh, establishing control, and then uh, taking the subject all the way down to the ground. And so they would go through that and then they would change the type of punch up. It might be an edge weapon attack. It might be a gun grab, but they're just working on their own. So they're learning that they can do combine this imagery with the physical practice and they can do it on their own. It might be something where we're watching a video and we stop a video at a key decision point and talk about what could you do. And again, the word could is important. I think we should use the word could over would and should because would and should implies that there's one right answer as opposed could implies that there's multiple ways to solve this problem. So we'd have conversations about what could you do? Then I could give them a, a minute to think about, okay, so what do you think might be most effective for you, most comfortable for you? And I could just then have them close their eyes and, and imagine doing that and resolving that situation. So in addition to the structured guided imagery, which we used to do a lot of um, and we, in officer safety and control tactics and in driving and other elements, uh, I would also have them be working on those other skills so that they, by the end of it, they learn uh, how to, what are some of the keys to effective independent imagery or imagery for themselves. And again, if any of, any of your viewers or listeners are interested, I have a, a webinar that talks about nine keys to effective self imagery or independent imagery. If they want to send me an email, I can certainly send them a link to that, um, that they could look at and, and share some of those elements with their people uh, to help through that. So I think we need to develop both those skills. And then we should also be training our FTOs or our PTOs on uh, imagery skills and how to use questioning and imagery uh, effectively as, a, as an FTO or a PTO um, so that they're reinforcing it. Uh, teaching our frontline supervisors how to build some of this into uh, training at the start of shift to shift brief or roll call training if they get in the habit of doing 10 minutes a day on, on some of this. Uh, and starting to weave together a bunch of these elements. So I think we need to look long-term and start to weave it into a number of things. Just one other quick example, because I know when you talk to uh, Dr. Melise Yilmaz-Balban about her research on the effectiveness of 
cyclical sigh. If we're going to build in a breathing technique, whether it's cyclical sigh or whether we just teach people to be exhale focused and just make the exhale longer than the inhale. Um, but what we could do is we could take the recruits week one of the academy, have them sit in a police car, reach over, turn a siren on from the passenger side to the driver's side so that they understand how to activate the license siren, how loud a siren is inside of a car. And then at random times, every single day throughout the academy, an instructor in any session could just stop their session and say, okay, let's just pause for a minute. What I want you to do is I want you to just close your eyes and imagine. Imagine that you're out on patrol and imagine this call just came in. You're the closest unit there to respond an officer needs assistance or shots fired call. And I want you to imagine reaching over and turning on the lights and siren. And as you reach over to turn on the lights and siren, I want you to breathe, use that breathing technique and get them to breathe. And we, we do that for about two minutes. And then we say, okay, uh, <laughs> open your eyes. And now let's get back to whatever the topic on hand is. And as we go through training, now we can start to actually play a siren in the classroom while we're having them do that imagery. Then we can get to the point where we play an audio recording. So they're hearing an officer scream on the radio for help. Uh, officer down, shots fired. And they're imagining that they're the closest responding unit and they're activating the lights and siren and they're activating that breathing. So we're tying some of these things in together, but we're doing little pieces of imagery, you know, 30 seconds or a minute or two minutes all the time uh, in addition. And they're doing it on their own. We're just setting the scene for them. But then we can help them understand that you can do this at home anytime Right. So they're developing those skills, parallel skills, so that when they leave there, they know how to do imagery effectively for themselves. Okay. So you mentioned a couple of things there that I think are really important to reinforce. And this whole idea of interleaving, of how yes. imagery should be not only at the beginning of the academy, which is critically important, and continue, you know, string it all the way through but also it needs to be wide throughout the academy and interleaved with the various disciplines, because I think what can happen is you can have a control tactics instructor or a firearms instructor that's really into this stuff and buys in and understands the importance of it, but then it's completely disconnected and dropped in, in all the other aspects of training, including the academics as well. Um, and so interleaving it all the way through is is critically important um you you use the you gave an example of using a video and so um how would you see uh so for example let's say you're going to do this in roll call you're going to show because typically the way we show videos or it's shown in law enforcement is we just show the whole video to the end and then we just will basically well if that was me i would have done this and done that and right. But I think there's a much more effective way that we can actually tie the use of video and imagery together. And, and so what would you comment on that, Brian? How would you advise that we do that? First of all, my general recommendation is there's very rarely ever a reason uh, to show the whole video. And the danger of showing the whole video is now we're going to comment on it based on hindsight bias because we know what happened and we know the outcome which any of us in the middle of those events and the officer, the deputy, the trooper, the constable in the middle of that event did not know the outcome. So my advice is stop it at key decision points and then have conversations about what could you do when you find yourself in a similar situation. So I think videos are a tremendous opportunity to interleave uh, this training. So for example, uh, at this year's uh, National Association of Field Training Officers Conference, I showed a brief clip from a video that's about 30 seconds of an event that an officer is involved in. Um, and then we stop it. And then I say, okay, based on the 30 seconds, now here's the caveats. You're not allowed to comment at all on what the deputy did. You're not allowed to be critical at all of what the deputy did. This is not about the deputy. I want you to come up with a list of all of the topics that you could address from a training perspective as a field training officer with a recruit. So it's things like policy, procedure, the law, tactics, communication, vehicle positioning, um, approach to vehicle. There's, there's a myriad of things. So in that 30 seconds of video, if we were doing this at roll call, um, that might take us a week or two weeks just to get through the first 
30 seconds of video addressing all these different elements. And then we go on to the next part. The thing with videos is um, let's stop making it about the officer or the deputy or the trooper, the constable in the video, and let's make it about us instead of what should they have done. Or <clears throat> again, as you said, one of the worst things that a trainer or somebody who's an alleged expert in the field could ever say is uh, if I was there, that's what I would have done um, because that's just crap. And so we need to make it about us. When I find myself in a similar situation, what would I most like to do? And in order for us to answer that question, we have to imagine different solutions, different opportunities, different obstacles. And that becomes another important piece with imagery is it's not just imagining unicorns and rainbows. We need to imagine what challenges or obstacles might we face. I might use a uh, conductive energy weapon and it has no effect or it completely malfunctions. I might get shot. I might get punched. I might get stabbed. Uh, I might uh, <clears throat> get injured uh, in this fight. Uh, there's a myriad of things that might happen. I might have a stoppage with my farm in the middle of this. We need to imagine what those obstacles or challenges might be. And then we need to imagine overcoming them. Because if we only ever imagine positive outcomes and never imagine uh, the other, then we're going to set ourselves up potentially for failure. So, you know, for example, surgeons will often, uh, before they go in to conduct a surgery, will run through the surgery multiple times in their head, will imagine it. But one of the things they imagine is what could go wrong so that when it happens, they have a solution. That was one of the things Sully Sullenberger did. He studied plane crashes through his whole uh, career in the Air Force and as a commercial airline pilot to look at decisions and imagine himself in those situations and what could he do potentially differently to change the outcome. So I think that's another piece of that. Absolutely. And, you know, I like how you phrase that about what could you do rather than, you know, what, what should you do? And I was thinking that even in a constraints led approach, and, you know, we, we've, we're, we're quite supportive of the ecological dynamics constraint led approach to motor learning but I would even see, so for example, if you're going to do ground fighting, but you're going to change constraints, let's say I'm going to put students in a ground fight where they're in a mount, they uh, have somebody in a mount position and they have to defeat that, but I'm going to constrain them by saying, okay, for the purpose of these next drills, your dominant arm is non-functional. So you're going to just tuck it in and hold it in. But maybe before I put them in that drill is I'm going to do, now do an imagery session. It's going to say, this is what it's going to be. I want you to imagine that you're in this situation. Your dominant arm is non-functional because of an injury. And so you're going to, I want you to imagine how would you defeat or solve, escape this position? Um, and what could you do in that situation without the use of that arm? And then put them in that drill and then do another imagery session at the end of it to reinforce what they did well to get them to explore other opportunities or affordances for solutions. Um, so what do you think about that? Could it, could imagery be used as part of a, a whole incorporating a, a physical skill application like that? Absolutely. And uh, in that if we're looking at the ecological uh, approach, the ecological dynamics framework and the constraints led approach, my imagery around that would be that when they're on the ground and they've suffered that injury to their dominant arm and their dominant arm is uh, they're not able to use it, that they are going to remain calm, they're focused, they're in control, they're confident, they're going to have the ability to read what it is that the attacker is doing and take advantage of those uh, opportunities for action that are afforded by the subject, rather than having them imagine a specific response. Um, I'm going to have them be aware that they're very much aware of the subject and have the ability to read. They have that feel because they're calm and they're when the opportunity presents itself, they're going to focus on their breathing to calm themselves down. And they're going to have the ability to read those openings or those opportunities for action that are afforded by the opponent and immediately take advantage of that with explosive action to defeat that. And it might be different in different situations, depending on it, because it's going to depend on that 
constant performer task environment interaction. And so it's part of it is what does the subject give me? Or when I do this, what do they do in response to that? And what does that open up? Um, because one situation might open up me taking them to my left. The other might take have me taking them to the right. The one might be it just brings their head in closer to me and I'm able to hook their head and bring it in closer and then do something else. So I would make it generic so that it focuses on principles and concepts that they can apply depending on what uh, affordances are <laughs> open up for them in the middle of this situation, rather than giving them specific technique focus things in the start. Uh, and then again, we could afterwards, we could do imagery where again, they have the ability to be dexterous adaptive problem solvers to respond to whatever is afforded to them uh, in the situation, but through this constant interaction and take advantage of that to exploit that in that particular moment, regardless of what it is, so that we could reinforce those cons the principles uh, and concepts rather than having them just think, well, I need to do A and then do B and then do C and then do D. And we're starting to see that shift in uh, the martial arts world where some BJJ practitioners and MMA trainers are teaching their people using the ecological dynamics approach to train their people, not in techniques, but just to be problem solvers. So that's how I would just kind of structure the imagery uh, personally. Excellent. That's really helpful. And I like how you you spoke about, so even afterwards, you know, we could, because I think, Brian, one of the things that we we don't do enough of is explore our students' understanding of why they did what they did and what worked well for them and then what was less desirable that they would like to change in the future. You know, we're very quick to focus on things that that go wrong. Um, but I mean, when I interviewed Dr. Joel Seuss on decision-making and feedback, he was very, um, very clear on the importance of, you know, we need to walk our students through their understanding of what did they see when did they see it? Why was it important? And then what decisions did they make? So do you think that imagery could be a powerful tool to use in that debriefing process to reinforce even what our students did well, but to get them to understand why? Absolutely, because imagery is naturally going to be part of a debriefing process. So I think the keys to effective debriefing are to ask more, tell less. Because in order for them to answer the question, they need to imagine what happened, right? Or imagine what they would or could do. Uh, we need to be strengths-based, so focused on what they did well. Um, then focus on feed forward rather than feedback. Instead of what you should have done, what could you do differently when you encounter a similar situation in the future? We can never go back in time and change the past, but we can go, <clears throat> we can prepare for the future. That's, I think that's why we do debriefings is to prepare for the future. And so then we can incorporate imagery as we have some of these conversations. And I, I really took a lot out of your interview with Joel, and I've had the pleasure of interviewing him a couple of times myself. But again, I think if we ask those things, so what was your goal in this and what were you prioritizing? Uh, what were you attending to? And then what did it mean to you to come up with that sense making? So how did they make sense of what they were attending to and perceived? And then based on that, what decisions did they make? And then what problems did they have to solve? So I think when we focus on that kind of framework, as you talked about, then we build imagery into that. And as we work through this, and then they talk about, well, you know what, I could do this in the future to solve this problem where I got stuck here. Okay, can you imagine yourself doing that? Well, yeah, I could. Okay, do me a favor, close your eyes and allow yourself to imagine it and let them go through it two or three times in their mind. Um, and then we can move on from there. So I think, uh, the briefings are a great opportunity for us to incorporate some of that uh, imagery. Now, you talked with uh, Adam Nichols. You guys were talking at near the end about can we use this uh, to help to mitigate some of the long-term effects of, of trauma for officers. And so I think this is a very similar thing. So if I get back to the car, I can either ruminate about what I screwed up and what I did wrong – uh, which is imagery, but it's reinforcing those less desirable files and images. Or I can either on my own or my FTO could guide me through this. I could focus on, okay, so what did you do? What did you do well? 
So what were the positives out of that? What were the learning out of this? And then what could you do differently again? And, and then focus on those things. And then we can do some breathing and imagine that on the exhale, we're just letting go of all of the judgment, all of the criticism, all of the blame, all of that. And what we're doing is we're enhancing the learning. Um, so as you know, I'm a big fan of the Emergency Mind podcast and the Emergency Mind book with Dan Dworkis. But Dan Dworkis is an emergency room physician, one of the busiest uh, hospitals in L.A. But, you know, he I've heard him say that, you know what, at the end of uh, working on a trauma case where that person dies. Rather than walking away and just ruminating, one of the things he does is he'll thank them. Thank them for helping me learn. I'm sorry that I could not do more for you in this case, but thank you for helping me learn. Thank you for the gift that you gave me of learning so that I can help others in a more effective way down the road. I think it's the same if we're like, like an FTO or PTO at the end of training. Um, if I just get bombarded with all the stuff that I screwed up, then I'm just going to go home and ruminate on that. But if I, if my FTO says to me, tell me about two positive things you learned today. Tell me about one thing that you did today that you're proud of. Tell me about one thing that you did today that's in complete alignment with the core values of the organization. They ask a series of questions to get me focused on the positive. Now, I'm going to have to reflect back. I'm going to have to pull those things forward. I'm going to have to imagine doing those things. But now I'm focused on the positive. So I think there's a lot of ways that we could utilize some of these things um, for to help uh, the, get rid of the blame and the guilt uh, that we very often feel when we think we we screwed something up. And so I think trainers can set that bar uh, at the academy. F FTOs and PTOs can reinforce it out in the field by doing these things properly. And then I think we set people on a better path. So, <clears throat> Brian, with regards to the academy on that, and I think you bring up an excellent point, is you know, we need to make sure that the culture, the learning culture in the academy is one that's positive, that's productive, that actually, you know, and I hate to use buzzwords, but it's one that the psychologists use. So I'll use it. It's psychological safety um, for pushing yourself, for making mistakes, for learning, because really the only way that our people are going to really learn how to perform out in the real world is by making mistakes in the learning environment. But so often, I think we have a culture where mistakes are frowned on, their recruits are belittled, it's a paramilitary type of structure, where there's no uh, permission, or there's no safety in pushing yourself and making mistakes. And then we shouldn't be surprised after six months of indoctrination of that type of culture that now when they're out on the street, now they're, they are ruminating on the mistakes they make, their performance, what they view as failures rather than opportunities for learning. So do you think that there's a big lesson here for trainers to make sure they set a culture of training that includes the ability, the safety to, to, to make mistakes, to learn from mistakes, to embrace mistakes, to and, and that's what the training environment is designed for. Absolutely. And and I think we've we've taken and bastardized this term psychological safety. But if you listen to Amy Edmondson, who was not the inventor of it, but is really the person who brought it into the consciousness today in the world. And she's a professor at uh, Harvard. Um, but one of the things she talks about is psychological safe environment. Does that mean that you, people are not going to be held accountable to live up to performance expectations? That absolutely is part of it. And it's not this... Uh, <clears throat> trigger-free environment. It's an environment where we're going to have difficult conversations. So it's an environment where you have high standards. People know what the expectations are. Uh, we're going to work people, but there's an understanding that uh, I think what we need to understand is that struggle is part of learning. Uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman and uh, Malicio Masbalban worked in Huberman's lab for a number of years. Uh, one of the things that Huberman, who is a professor of neurobiology at Stanford School of Medicine, says is if there is no struggle, if there is no friction, then there is no learning. So in order for neuroplasticity to take place, as you know, there needs to be some struggle, some friction. That's why we talk about desirable difficulties, the term coined by Robert Bjork at UCLA. 
So people need to understand that this struggle is part of it. Um, and as you've talked about a number of times before, we need to stop uh, believing that performance in this moment or in this block of training represents learning, that the learning is going to take place over time. And so we need to create this environment where people, uh, that it's okay to struggle. And we should be telling them up front, you're going to struggle. That's natural. That's normal. That's important. If you're not struggling, then you're not learning. So we need to create this environment where they're not afraid of pushing um, because they're afraid of being punished. And again, um, you know, this, the, some of these academies that just take the stress exposure or stress inoculation model and completely flip it on its head, that's not conducive to learning and it's not conducive to long-term health. So absolutely, we need to change the culture of the academies, have high standards, have high expectations, but let people know that the struggle is part of learning and growth and that everybody who's really good at something now once sucked at it. And so that the, they, it's okay when they find themselves struggling, it's okay and they need to embrace the struggle because it's part of learning. So absolutely, I think that that culture, cultural shift is critical. Right. And even those who are really good at something, typically those types of people have a, a deep growth mindset where even they don't view themselves as being good at something. They view themselves as still being a student with a whole lot to learn and they actually look for opportunities to put themselves in discomfort and challenge so that they can make mistakes and learn from them because they understand that's the only environment where we actually grow. Absolutely. And I think that mindset, that growth mindset that Carol Dweck talks about, where we have this fundamental belief that if we do the work, we can get better. But the other piece, I think, from Dweck's work is that none of us are all fixed or all growth. Because I see a lot of people in the in law enforcement training world that have a growth mindset around the area that they teach, but they have a fixed mindset around other areas. So I know firearms people that will not go to control tactics training and vice versa, or people that will not, that are instructors that will not go to scenario based training. Uh, because they have a fixed mindset around some of those other areas. So you're absolutely right. If you look at the people that uh, we consider to be masters in a field, uh, they consider themselves to still be students and learning, and they're continually pushing and being <clears throat> okay with making mistakes. So, Great. Brian, we're quickly coming up on an hour already, but there's two things I want to ask you. The first one is around language. And I know you've been, you're, and even in this interview, you've been very careful with your language and the words that you choose, and that's on purpose. So first, can you talk to us about the importance of language? So as a trainer, um, whether you're using imagery or not, but I mean, we obviously encourage our trainers to use performance enhancement imagery, but what's the role of language? If you can first talk, talk about that, and then uh, I'm going to ask you about your, you have a very extensive five-day performance enhancement imagery course that you've been running for several years. I'll get you to talk to us about that and what a student could expect to learn in your five-day performance enhancement imagery course. So first of all, about the language. So we talked about imagine versus visualize. What we need to understand is that language is going to translate into images in the head. So uh, again, one of the other things we advocate on uh, performance enhancement imagery and excellence in training is use positive based language, eliminate the word don't. Uh, because if you say to somebody, don't do X, in order for them to figure out what not to do, they have to imagine doing X. And that's the image that comes into their head. And, and then, <clears throat> so what they actually hear is do X. So they repeat in their head a bunch of times. And then when they do it under pressure, then we're mad at them. So we need to learn to communicate to people in positive terms what it is that we want them to do. Uh, we need to stop talking, in my opinion, about survival, about career survival, about officer survival survival. I don't want people to survive their careers in law enforcement. I want them to thrive in their careers in law enforcement and thrive afterwards. I don't want them to survive a violent encounter. I want them to win a violent encounter. And if you talk about winning and you talk about survival, the images that come to mind are very different. And so we need to understand that words have power. Again, we talked about could versus would or should. So again, could opens it up to a whole bunch of possibilities. What would you do? Nobody knows what they would do until they're actually in that event. And what should you do implies that there's some right answer when the reality is there's a whole bunch of different answers. The other thing with language in imagery sessions or scripts 
is uh, to be careful about painted words like pain. So we will talk about when you get sprayed with OC, because we would do uh, imagery before they got sprayed with OC spray. And what we talk about is any discomfort you feel from the OC spray in your face just causes you to be more focused uh, and concentrate on, on winning this confrontation, getting control of the subject. Uh, if I'm doing uh, imagery where officers are imagining using good tactics, but getting shot because you can use the best tactics in the world and still get shot, um, then I'm going to talk about the discomfort that you might feel as a result of that round. Because again, it's different for everybody. So I'm going to avoid language where I'm talking about you feel this intense burning to your face and your eyes slam shut and, and those type of things and create a different image in their head of what they can experience. So I think we need to be very intentional about language and just make some subtle shifts, uh, understanding the importance of it. Um, and again, it, it ties in with pictures. So if you have these pictures on your ranges of these perfect site pictures, rip them down. That's not a site picture. That's a picture of sites. There's a difference between a picture of sites and a site picture. A site picture is a moving event. So the gun is moving, the sites are moving, the hand is moving. Take a video of that and show them so they have an image of their head of what their <laughs> should be experienced as opposed to creating some impossible standard. As far as the performance enhancement imagery course, so I have a five-day excellence in training course where we do a deep dive into imagery, and then I have a three-day standalone performance enhancement imagery course where we do an even deeper dive into it. So with that, we talk about some of the things that we talked about here, the definition uh, of it, the purpose of it, the power of words that it can be done for yourself. We can deliver imagery at one-on-one -on -one from a guided imagery uh, perspective or to a group. Um, uh, we talk about the mind, the roles and responsibilities of the mind. We talk about monitoring and managing that internal dialogue because that self-talk is important because the self-talk very often is reflective of those images we have at the sub subconscious some being positive, some being negative. It's our thought, it's our mind, it's our language, it's our images. We can change them. And when we understand and we have that power, then we can change language to change performance. Uh, we talk about uh, building and delivering performance enhancement imagery sessions. So I take I provide people with a whole bunch of different examples of uh, people that have done imagery in a variety of settings in one-on-one. Uh, in -on -one. They, they did it for themselves. They show a video of the Blue Angels, uh, U.S. Navy performance flying team doing imagery, which they do every single day. Um, and then, but then we teach them how to build scripts, imagery scripts, and they get the opportunity to practice those. They get the opportunity to build a uh, complete imagery script for something where they're the subject matter resource or where they coach or they teach. But they also get the opportunity to interview somebody else for something that they want to work on and then build an imagery script for that person specific for them and then take them through that. Uh, so they get all kinds of uh, opportunities with this. We talk about debriefings and videos and other elements, but they get a lot of opportunity to practice, to experience imagery, and to practice uh, delivering imagery, and to actually build imagery scripts um, so that when they walk away, they have the ability to uh, build a script for something that they teach or that they coach, and then also to build a script for somebody else when that person uh, says, could you help me with fill in the blanks? So uh, there's a lot. It's a very uh, comprehensive uh, program, but they get a lot of experience with it. And it starts, it breaks down a bunch of those barriers. A bunch of people, uh, it's very difficult to get people on the course, but consistently when they come on the course, they go, wow, I wish I would have had this 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago. And then they start to understand the value of it and they understand how to use it. And then they go away with a, now that tool that they can implement in their training and in their life. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you added that last part because that was something that certainly, you know, I have the benefit of having been trained uh, by you and having the pleasure of work with you for many, many years together. And the, this whole mental imagery, performance enhancement imagery, visualization, whatever you want to call it, is it's an all of life experience. And that's what I, I really found. And I, I know a lot of other trainers who have taken the training 
do as well. They come to the course thinking this is a tool they're going to be able to use in law enforcement, which it certainly is. But what they really realize afterwards is this is an all of life experience. It's about how you relate to yourself, how you interpret yourself and your own experiences and the words and the framework that you put to that, how you relate to your spouse or your significant other, how you relate to your children and really how you relate to everybody around you um, that you encounter. So it's an extremely helpful and important type of, of training. Brian, is there anything else that you would like to leave as a word of encouragement for trainers? How can they uh, find out more about this? How can they contact you? Where would they go from here? Uh, well, just w one thing I'd just like to, to build on something that uh, Adam and Arne t touched on uh, around the pet lab model of uh, imagery. And I think it's important for people to understand, and I've heard uh, Holmes and Collins, the, the creators of that framework, and uh, Wakefield and Smith and others that have done a lot of research into it and a lot of use of it, talk about the fact that, that it's a uh, guideline, not a checklist. So I think trainers need to be cautious about understanding that uh, they need to do every one of these things in this order, look at it as a guideline and understand the difference between what we do and, and the sports world. And a lot of the research, when you look at it, it's a specific skill. So uh, taking a penalty shot in field hockey or penalty kick in soccer or a uh, goal kick in rugby, uh, as opposed to a dynamic, rapidly unfolding uh, high stress event that might result in somebody getting seriously injured. So look at the, the framework, but understand that it is a, uh, a guideline, not a checklist. And again, the, a lot of the research is, is fairly new. Um, so, you know, just in the last 10 years or so, in fact, uh, Wakefield and Smith in a paper that they wrote on uh, in 2012 said that the original pet lab papers and the research testing the model are quite technical in nature and have been published in journals that are not very accessible to coaches and athletes. Therefore, despite the strong research support, the model is not widely known and used outside of academia in their experience. So that was 2012, so 11 years ago. I think we're seeing it expand, especially over in Europe and the UK. Um, but so so have a look at all of this and then take the philosophy of Bruce Lee, adopt what is useful, uh, set aside what is not, and add what is uniquely your own. So if people want to uh, get a hold of me, my email address is winningmind, all one word, winningmind at mac.com. So that's winningmind at mikealphacharlie.com. Uh, my website, my main website is winningmindtraining.com, winningmindtraining.com. So there's information there about the courses, um, if they're interested in any of the leadership courses or any of the other, the performance enhancement imagery course or any of those that are there. And then the other main website I have is uh, the excellenceintrainingacademy.com, excellenceintrainingacademy.com. So if people have questions or would like that webinar on the nine keys to effective use of independent imagery, just send me an email at winningmind at mac.com. All right. Fantastic. Brian, thanks so much for making the time again. Really appreciate you and what you do. Thanks, Chris. Likewise.